Good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Zulimo Skang, and I'm the Support Center Manager for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. We'd like to thank you for joining AFA's webinar, A Parent's Guide to Asthma Care at School. We have a great program for you today. Our speakers are Stacey Denham, Public Health Manager, and Jessica Jackson, Asthma and Respiratory Health Programs Manager. Today we'll be discussing asthma care at school. More specifically, we will be walking through a step-by-step -step guide to asthma care. We'll cover asthma basics, review an asthma school toolkit, learn how to develop a care team, discuss asthma-friendly school settings like classroom environment and indoor air quality, and finally, we will wrap up with a quick question and answer session. Now, I would like to hand it over to our presenters, Jessica and Stacy. Stacy, take us away. Thank you so much, Zulima. We appreciate you opening up the program. Before we dive in, I would love to tell you a little bit more about ASMA and who we are. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America aims to be a trusted ally of the asthma and allergy community. We are dedicated to saving lives and reducing the burden of these diseases through our support, advocacy, education, and research. Without you, our community, we wouldn't be here. So thank you guys for everything you do for those everywhere with asthma and allergies. Now, we're gonna take a couple of seconds to review some house rules. Everyone's video and audio are on mute. If you have questions, there is a chat box that you can ask all the questions you want throughout the duration of the program. All the questions will be received through our chat and they will be answered by the end of the presentation. So please ask as many as you would like. There will also be resources posted in the chat as well. And yes, this webinar will be recorded and is being recorded and will be sent out to, all, to an email to all who registered within the next week. So. Without further ado, introductions. My name is Stacy, and I'm the Public Health Manager here at AFA, and it's a privilege to get to talk with everyone here today. You just heard from Zulima, our colleague who is our Support Center manager, manager, and she makes sure everything runs smoothly on the back end and helps throughout the duration of the program uh, today. And she's gonna also moderate portions of today's program. So. Jessica and I will be co-hosting today's program, and we would like to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Jessica, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessica. I have a background in epidemiology, respiratory therapy, and asthma education, and I joined the AFA team back in February as the Asthma and Respiratory Health Programs Manager, and I am looking forward to talking with you all today about how to manage asthma in the school setting. And actually, speaking of school settings, we're just going to start off with a, a quick quiz. And we just want to get a read on how everybody used to feel about going back to school. We'll give you all a second there. And I think we can, whenever you're ready, Zulima, we can close the poll. Yes, it looks like it's a mix of all of the above. I agree. I also felt a mix of all of those things <laughs> before I went back to school. And now that we've gotten that, that quick read, I'm going to hand it back to Stacy, who's going to talk a little bit about managing and preventing asthma at school. Absolutely. Oh, it's so interesting to see all of those responses. I remember feeling excited, overwhelmed, nervous, ready to see all my friends at school and have a lot of fun. So I remember if I feel those things, our kiddos these days definitely have those emotions. They may not always be able to express it, but they're definitely feeling it. So let's talk a little bit about going back to school and getting in the mindset of being a child. There's some really big feelings and thoughts that come with the start of the school year. Maybe you are a first time parent of a little one that is going to school with asthma for the first time. Maybe your kiddo with allergic asthma is switching to a new school, or maybe your child with exercise-induced bronchoconstriction welcomes new experiences and a new playground with open arms and loves to run around and play. 
or maybe even your little one with moderate to severe asthma, maybe a little bit more reserved and introverted. Every child is unique and every child is different. And the most important thing, so is their asthma. So we are gonna celebrate that today and we're gonna celebrate the diversity of that. So let's acknowledge that they will be feeling some big emotions prior to and throughout the duration of the school year. Sometimes these feelings and emotions can play a big part in our child's asthma management, with remembering to take medication or getting back into the routine of school and taking med medication, not wanting to go to the school nurse's office because they're feeling short of breath and they don't want to miss out on all the fun, or feeling like they want to hide their asthma and their asthma symptoms from others. Sometimes big emotions can also trigger asthma symptoms in your child's asthma. So there's a lot that happens. There's a lot of fun and exciting things going on in the beginning of the year. Let's jump in and explore it. First, we know that at every program we do here at AFA, we go over the basics of asthma. So this time we have another pop quiz. So Jessica, start us off for this pop quiz. Sure, yeah. So we just, again, want to get a read from the audience. So we just want to know what you all think. Uh, how many people in the United States have asthma? And we'll launch that poll and give you a minute to choose your answers. And then, Salima, whenever you're ready, we can close the poll. And it looks like we got a mix of answers. The, the correct answer is over 25 million people have asthma in the United States. And with that, I'm just gonna start talking a little bit more about asthma basics, starting off by discussing what asthma is. So asthma is a chronic lung disease that causes inflammation and narrowing of the airways. And this can lead to asthma symptoms, which can be any combination of coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, and or chest tightness or pain. And asthma affects both children and adults. It is actually the most common chronic disease among children aside from dental caries or tooth cavities. And in 2019, asthma affected an estimated 262 million people and caused 455,000 deaths. It also accounted for 4.9 million doctor's office visits, over 169,000 discharges from hospital inpatient care and 1.5 million emergency department visits. Unfortunately, like with so many other health conditions, there are asthma disparities. Uh, for example, black people in the United States are six times more likely than white people in the United States to visit the emergency department for asthma. And asthma disparities, so they're not uh, specific to the United States, they're actually a global issue. Uh, for instance, most asthma-related deaths occur in low and lower middle-income countries uh, where underdiagnosis and undertreatment is a major challenge. There's no cure for asthma, but it can be controlled with the right combination of medications and trigger control strategies. And when medications are taken properly as prescribed and triggers are controlled, most people with asthma can lead a healthy, active life. So there are many myths about asthma, and I just like to go through and dispel some of the most common ones. You've probably heard a few of these. Uh, the first myth is that asthma only occurs in childhood and is typically outgrown. So this is not true. Uh, asthma is a chronic lung disease, and once someone has asthma, they do have it their entire life. Uh, however, it is possible for asthma symptoms to come and go, uh, and sometimes they might even go away for years at a time. And this can give the impression that asthma has been outgrown and then it's gone away, but this actually is not the case. So the airways of a person who has asthma are a bit more swollen or more likely to swell in the presence of triggers than the airways of a person that doesn't have asthma. And this is true even if the person with asthma is not having symptoms. When asthma symptoms are absent, it basically just means that the swelling and the narrowing isn't necessarily bad enough to cause symptoms or to interfere with lung function. And there's a graphic on the next slide that illustrates this well, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But first, I'd just like to go through a few more common asthma myths. So a second myth is that if you're not wheezing, it isn't asthma. So not everybody with asthma wheezes. Asthma and asthma symptoms, they vary from person to person, and asthma can present in slightly different ways for different people. 
In fact, uh, sometimes the only asthma symptom that might be present is a cough, and this is, this is especially common in children. Another asthma myth is that asthma is not a serious disease. So as we discussed on the previous slide, uncontrolled asthma does cause a significant number of hospitalizations, emergency department visits, and deaths. So it can be a very serious condition when it's not well managed. A fourth common myth is that asthma medicines are habit-forming and dangerous. So asthma medications, they're not habit-forming, and for most people, they are safe and effective. And then finally, people with asthma should not play sports. Uh, so exercise is a really important part of a healthy lifestyle, and when asthma is well controlled, most people can live a healthy, active life. And physical activity, again, it's important for everyone with asthma, uh, every, everybody, including people with asthma. So when the right medications are taken um, and it is well managed, people can engage in the sports and the physical activity they enjoy. So there are three main changes to the airways and asthma. So first, asthma causes inflammation and overproduction of mucus inside the airways. This in turn causes the airways to become hypersensitive or overly sensitive. And this hypersensitivity then makes the muscles that are wrapped around the airways spasm. And this is known as bronchospasm. So the inflammation, overproduction of mucus and bronchospasm causes the airways to become narrow. And this leads to the asthma symptoms we discussed previously, which again can be any combination of coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, and or chest tightness or pain. And then I did just want to draw your attention quickly to this graphic. So this illustrates why uh, a person who has asthma always has asthma, even if they're not necessarily having symptoms. So if you look at the airway to the far left, they, they refer to it as a normal airway in this graphic. So that's a healthy airway. You can see that there, it's not swollen inside. The mucus production, which is that yellow stuff in there, it's normal. And the muscles, so those red bands that are wrapped around the outside of the airway, they're relaxed. So you can see there's a nice big space in there to breathe. If you look at the middle airway, that's the airway of someone who has asthma, but this person is not necessarily having symptoms. Even though they're not necessarily having symptoms, if you compare it to the normal airway, you can see that it's a little bit more swollen, there's a little bit more mucus being produced in there, and the space inside that airway is just a tiny, tiny bit smaller than the, the normal or healthy airway. Then if you look at the airway to the far right, so this is the airway of a person who has asthma and is most likely having symptoms. So you can see that it's very swollen. There's a lot of mucus being produced in there. And then if you look at the outside, you can see that those muscles are squeezing and spasming. And so this person likely was exposed to a trigger or something that they're sensitive to that caused the inflammation inside the airway to get worse to the point where they are now actually feeling the effect of that inflammation through symptoms. So asthma, it, again, it can't be cured, but it can be managed, and that's done by avoiding asthma triggers, which we'll discuss in a bit, taking medicines to prevent and control symptoms, and also treating asthma episodes as they occur. So there are different types of asthma. One type is allergic asthma, and this just means that allergens trigger your asthma symptoms, and up to 90% of children with asthma have allergic asthma. And common allergens that trigger allergic asthma are dust mites, animal dander, pollen, and mold spores. Other things can trigger asthma as well, and these include physical activity, irritants, air pollutants, and illnesses like colds or the flu. And it is also very common for all of these triggers to be present in the school environment. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about triggers on the next slide. So people with asthma have airways that are sensitive to certain things that might not bother people who don't have asthma. And these are called triggers and they do vary from person to person. And when a person with asthma is exposed to something they're sensitive to, this triggers an inflammatory response in the lungs and leads to asthma symptoms. So we discussed a few common triggers on the previous slide, such as allergens, irritants, exercise, and respiratory illnesses. But there are other common triggers that can worsen asthma as well. And these include strong emotions, weather changes or extreme weather, and GERD or acid reflux. Other less common triggers are foods, especially those that contain sulfites, and then certain medications like NSAIDs. Uh, so an example of an NSAID would be something like ibuprofen. And certain heart medications, such as beta blockers, uh, they can also worsen asthma as well. It's important for asthma patients to avoid their triggers uh, by adopting multi-component strategies. Exercise is somewhat of an, an exception in the sense that it shouldn't necessarily be avoided, 
Uh, if your child has asthma, when they play or do physical activity, talk with your doctor about a plan to prevent and control these symptoms because again, most people with asthma can live a healthy active life and engage in physical activity. So there are many medications that can treat asthma and they're divided into three main categories. Uh, first, there are controller medications which your provider might have you or your child's provider might have them take daily, even if they aren't necessarily having symptoms. And controllers, they address the underlying issue of asthma in the sense that they reduce the inflammation and the overproduction of mucus in the airways. And they tend to work slowly and they work over a long period of time. Quick relief medications, these medications are used as needed. They don't address the underlying issue of asthma in the sense that they don't really do a whole lot for the inflammation and the overproduction of mucus in the airways. They do, however, temporarily relax the muscles that are wrapped around the airways. And when these muscles relax, this pulls the airways open and it creates a bigger space to breathe. In quick relief medications, they work quickly, but they don't last long. And it kind of depends on the person and how fast they metabolize the medication, but it's typically between one to four hours. And then it's maybe six with lead albuterol. And finally, there are combination medicines that aim to control and relieve. And this brings us to the concept of smart therapy, which we'll discuss on the next slide. So smart therapy stands for single maintenance and reliever therapy. It combines a controller and a quick relief medication into one inhaler. And the current asthma management guidelines recommend a long acting beta agonist called famotorol to be used in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid called budesonide for smart. And this combination is found in an inhaler called Symbicort, or it's generic. And the budesonide in the Symbicort inhaler, it supplements the natural corticosteroids that are made by your body's adrenal gland. They're low dose and they target the airways specifically, which means that they tend to work pretty well and the risk of side effects is relatively low. And famotorol is a bronchodilator that acts quickly to open the airways and relieve sudden symptoms. It also keeps the airways open for a long time. Again, it kind of depends somewhat on the person, but usually up to about 12 hours. So Symbicort, it's not the only option for SMART. Some providers do prefer Dulura, which is an inhaler that contains famotorol and an inhaled corticosteroid called mometazone furate. And it works in the same way as the Symbicort. So interestingly, as of April 2023, the Food and Drug Administration has not yet approved these medicines to be used in this way. And unfortunately, some patients might encounter challenges with their insurance coverage. Uh, although some payers have added Simpacort and Delura to their preferred drug list and they will approve their use for SMART without prior auth. However, uh, some pharmacy benefit managers will impose strict quantity limits, which might actually fall below the maximum daily adult dose. So if standard treatments are ineffective on their own, uh, some providers may prescribe an add-on therapy called a biologic. Biologics are a kind of medicine made from the cells uh, of living things, and these cells might come from animals, plants, or bacteria. And there are many different types of biologics, so examples might include insulin, vaccines, or arthritis shots. And each biologic is different, and it's made to target specific molecules in the human body. In asthma biologics, they work by targeting cells and pathways that trigger inflammation. A pathway is a word doctors use to describe the chain reactions in your immune system that cause your asthma symptoms. Uh, in some biologics, they specifically target cells that lead to allergic information, such as amolizumab. Amolizumab, or the brand name is Zoller, is a biologic that treats asthma triggered by airborne allergens. It's given as an injection every two to four weeks. And something to note is since biologics are an add-on therapy, they're typically prescribed in addition to standard asthma treatments. So it's unlikely that, that your child's provider would have them stop taking their typical controller medications. And now I will hand it back to Stacy, who will discuss asthma school toolkits. Thank you so much, Jessica. It was a wonderful asthma basics review. I feel like I learned something every time you talk in, uh, about asthma. So let's now take a look at your asthma school toolkit. The asthma school toolkit is designed to help you bring your child's important information to your child's healthcare provider, their school nurse, or their school administration personnel, and their primary teacher. The goal is to encourage clear communication and draw that line between your child's asthma care team with an end goal of your child having a successful year of asthma control and management. 
And if you're listening uh, only and not watching our webinar, some of this information can also be found on our website at alpha.org backslash school. Oh, look at this. It's time for another pop quiz. I'm so excited. Salima, would you please help us launch our poll? Um, this time, we would love to know, what do you think? Having an asthma toolkit can provide clear communication and relieve some of the stress that comes with caring for a child with asthma. Is that true or false? And we'll just give you guys a little bit of time to answer that question and think about it. I know I have my answer. Let's see if we can close that poll and share the results. Absolutely true. <laughs> Wouldn't it be so nice to have a little bit of stress taken off your role as a caregiver? Let's do that and talk about it today. Let's see if we can close that poll over there. There we go. So let's talk about your asthma school kit. It should include the most important information about your child and their asthma. We recommend a communication roadmap, medical forms, medication and devices, and an emergency plan, and members of your asthma care team. Having all of this information in one place will help ensure your child has a successful year of asthma control and management at school. It's important that all communications, medical forms, medication and devices, and emergency plans are together in one place. And we know that each school is different and each school has different rules and procedures. Make sure you're following the rules of your child's school set forth by their administration. If you have a folder with forms, such as an asthma action plan or a medication card of your choosing, a copy of all these forms must be given to the school first, and then a copy can be stored in a bag with your child. If you are bringing medication to your child's school, remember, you must fill out all the appropriate forms listed by your child's school first. All students have the right to self-carry their medication in the U.S., but they must be documented. Keep this toolkit with the school nurse or administrative personnel your child goes to for assistance with their asthma. So let's dive in and see what this looks like. So our first step is to develop a communication roadmap. It's more than just a piece of paper. It's a broader process of how your communication is going to take place. And the first step puts down the paper and establishes who needs to know what about my child's asthma. For example, who is my child's primary teacher? And I need to let their teacher know that around 10 a.m., they might need to be excused from their class to visit the school nurse for a treatment or assistance. It spells out what they need to know. For example, if my child is allergic to animal dander, sitting them next to the class pet hamster might not be a great idea, as it may trigger their asthma symptoms and their allergies may worsen throughout the day. The communication roadmap also allows you, the caregiver, to schedule a meeting with the school nurse and primary teacher. It gives you an opportunity to tell them about your child's asthma if they can advocate for themselves, or if they're going to need a gentle reminder and a prompt and learn how to begin advocating for themselves. This plan gives you a safe space to discuss how you would like the communication to take place. Will the notes on the asthma action plan be enough? Or do you need to include more people such as extended family, the babysitter, or the person who might be picking your child up from school that day? if you are not around. It gives you a safe space to share how you would like to receive that communication and listen, most importantly, listen to the school and how they will communicate and how they also want to communicate. Finally, and almost most importantly, write this process down and make copies. Give it to everyone who takes care of your child. This could be as simple as names and contact numbers on a paper, it can look like an asthma action plan if you like that model. It can look like a logic model. I've even seen parents make a Venn diagram with their school nurse and their primary care teacher 
and use that as a communication process. It really is what is up to you and what you feel most comfortable with. So the next items you want to include in your, in your kit are medical forms. This will ensure easy access and also tell the person taking care of your child what to do and who to call in each circumstance. We, advise, we recommend that you have a small folder to hold as many forms um, for the school. Some schools have forms that they want you to fill out and want you to use. So remember, ask the school first, while others may only want one form or a form that you want to send to school. So on this slide, this is a small example of some medical forms you can keep in your toolkit. You can keep an asthma action plan, a supplementary treatment order, an asthma emergency treatment plan, or even an environmental asthma plan. These are just some options to keep out there. Uh, step three, medications and devices. Before school starts, you are gonna wanna check all your child's medications and devices. Check their nebulizer, check the solution, masks, inhalers, spacers. Ask yourself, what is my child going to need at school for their asthma? For inhalers and spacers, let's ask our provider to prescribe you extra, maybe two extra, even three if possible, if you can swing that, and if insurance will cover. One to keep at school, one to stay with your child at all times, and one to have at the caregiver's house. You wanna make sure that all medications are not expired, that they're placed in a closed, tight, sealed bag with your child's name on them. Some people like to write their child's name and date on the medication itself so it doesn't confuse with other children's medications. It's also important to remember that just like every state is different with different laws and policies, every school is different with different procedures and protocols. Private schools operate differently than public schools and so forth. Also of note, we want to make sure that quick relief medication needs to be easily accessible to students at all times throughout the school day while riding on school-based transportation, during school, before and after school activities. Staff managing these activities also need to have access to the child's medicine. Their spacers, their chambers, their nebulizers, they need to know where the asthma action plans are. Students in every state have the right to self-carry their medicine and uh, some children, especially younger children, will likely need help um, administering their medicine. All states allow students to self-carry and self-administer, but not every state and not every school ensures that the paperwork needed to allow students to self-carry and administer is clearly communicated. It is important to remember that if your child will be giving themselves their medication and carrying it, like we said in the previous slide, you must have a clearly written form that is shared with the parents and school staff. Step four, what is your emergency plan? What do we do in an asthma emergency? Where do we go? Who do we call? And when do we call 911? Every child is different and every child's asthma is different. So it's important to meet with your child's school and share what you know about your child's asthma with the school nurse, teacher, or administrator. They may know about asthma and what it is, but they're also learning about your child and how your child's asthma plays out day to day, what their symptoms are, how the child responds to their symptoms, when they might need medication, when they might be hiding that they have symptoms, or when they do need to go to the school nurse or administrator. So this is where your knowledge of your child comes into play and where you should communicate this to your care team. And finally, speaking of care team, let's make sure we have the support of our care team. A care team is essential to your child's experience of asthma at school. The care team approach ensures open lines of communication between all those who are involved in your child's asthma care what that team looks like is up to you and what is best for your child. So here's just an example of what a care team can look like. Sometimes it can take a lot to organize a team and make sure that information is being communicated. 
But at the end of the day, it helps you become a better advocate for your child and sets your child up for a successful year. So that care team can look like your child and you, the caregiver. It can look like your child's school nurse and their primary teacher all together. If there is no nurse, maybe there is a school administrator or a principal who acts in that role. If they play sports or after school activities, maybe part of that care team is the coach or the PE teacher as well. So build that care team and make sure everyone has forms, um, everything that they need to know about your child and their problem. So next, we're gonna dive in even further into asthma care team. Each person that takes care of your child outside of your home has a very important role to play in their care. So let's take a look. Oh, but pop quiz time. I'm so excited again. Let's uh, launch our poll here and see what a care team can help with. So care team can help by acting as a personal assistant, encouraging my child to pursue goals, ensuring communication by all involved, in your child's asthma care, calling in prescriptions to the school, or changing school policy. So I wonder what the answer is here. I think I have a feeling of what it might be. We'll give you about five more seconds to fill that out, and then we'll close it. All right, let's close that poll and share our results. Excellent. Wow, you guys are great. 100%. The answer is definitely C, ensuring uh, communication by all involved in your child's asthma care. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll so we can move on to that next slide and talk about why it's important to have an asthma care team. And you guys should already know, since we scored so well on all these pop quizzes, the care team approach ensures open lines of communication between all those who are involved in your child's asthma care. It allows this care to be standardized, tailored to your child and their specific needs. It ensures the creation of an asthma action plan, which is so important because it has those contact numbers on it, it has who to go to, when to go to, what medication to take and when. It ensures that your child, other caregivers, school staff, and school nurses understand how to use their medications, monitor and attain asthma control, and identify and mitigate asthma triggers. And this is really just a great visual to show you what it looks like. So we can talk about it all we want, but what it looks like is your child is in the center and that care is centered around their, your child. And that care is going from you, the caregiver, to the healthcare provider, to the school nurse, to the teacher, all centered around the child, all clear, direct lines of communication, ensuring that your child is covered every step of the way. And really, that's why a care team is so important. So how do you keep in communication? How do you make this work back and forth? You and your child's school both want for your child to have a quality education in a safe environment. So forming a partnership with your child's school is absolute key when it comes to successfully managing their asthma and allergies. So we're gonna to wanna to start by communication, communicating with the school about your child's asthma and allergies in writing. Ask to have a meeting. Um, start by writing an email and asking for a meeting with the school nurse or school principal and involve the key people who might be there in the planning process. These meetings can occur quarterly. They can occur twice a year, maybe once in the, in the summer before school starts. Whatever fits best with you, whatever fits best for your child and especially the school as well. Sometimes meetings include the school or a district nurse and a primary care teacher. And then throughout the child's schooling, you will be working with school and district staff. So remember, we're going to approach this with a positive mindset and a positive tone because we are all here for our child and working together for the best interests of our child. So it's important to teach your child in age appropriate ways how to manage their condition and how to advocate for themselves when they do have asthma episodes or asthma symptoms. 
And this mainly means learning how to recognize when you're having a symptom or knowing uh, when you are having an asthma attack, um, knowing how to minimize triggers or taking steps to prevent allergies or asthma in general. So those are just a few ways to keep in communication with your team and some tips on how to learn how to advocate for our own selves. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jessica to talk a little bit about asthma friendly school settings. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. So um, avoiding or reducing asthma triggers plays a really important role in managing asthma. Uh, students, teachers, and staff who have asthma may experience symptoms when they're exposed to certain triggers, and we discussed those previously. Uh, reducing these triggers can help everyone, uh, even people without asthma, breathe a little bit easier. So there are simple steps you can take to help your school become more asthma friendly. Uh, the first place to start is with the classroom. You can encourage teachers to use only approved cleaners from custodial staff and try to avoid cleaners with strong smells, uh, like something like Fabulosa or a Pine Sol should probably be avoided because they are harsh or they tend to be harsh and strong smelling and this can trigger asthma for some students. Also, uh, air fresheners, scented candles, even some disinfectants may contribute to asthma, asthma flares. They might trigger some symptoms. If you happen to be on the PTA uh, and one of your roles is to ensure that your school is asthma friendly, you can check with school maintenance about the school's air filter and ventilation system to make sure the indoor air quality is healthy for all students. So asthma triggers, they're, they're everywhere. They're at home, they're at school, they're, they're all around us. Uh, but some common asthma triggers in school settings include illness, roaches, rodents, mold, harsh cleaning products, personal care products, air fresheners, and strong emotions. Uh, additional triggers might include stress, first or secondhand tobacco smoke, or emissions from vaping, uh, exhaust from idling cars or school buses. Uh, you can reduce asthma symptoms and episodes by taking steps to eliminate or reduce asthma triggers in your school. And many of these triggers can be managed with no cost or low cost solutions, such as integrating pest management strategies, uh, repairing water leaks to stop the growth of mold, discouraging idling vehicles, switching cleaning products, and making the school campus tobacco and vape free. Students and staff uh, spend most of their days inside a school building without the ability to control the air they breathe. And they really depend on schools to provide the healthiest indoor air quality possible. And allergens, asthma triggers, and chemicals, they're common in many school buildings and they do contribute to poor indoor air quality. So reducing, again, reducing triggers, allergens, and irritants is a key part of asthma control. And unhealthy indoor air quality can lead to more asthma symptoms, which can also lead to more missed school days and sometimes even hospital stays. And additionally, uh, children with uncontrolled asthma might struggle to learn, and it's possible that they could fall behind academically as well. So schools can make changes to improve indoor air quality, again, many of them for little to no cost. Uh, for example, clean with unscented chemicals or chemicals that aren't quite as harsh. Uh, to reduce pet dander, try not to keep furry or feathered friends in the pets in the classroom. Uh, fix leaks to reduce the chance of mold. Also, consider placing certified asthma and allergy-friendly air cleaners in classrooms uh, where there are children or teachers with asthma. And so improving indoor air quality, it not only creates a healthier school, but it also promotes better learning as well. So participation in physical edu education, recess, and sports, these are typical activities your child might engage in at school. And exercise, active play, and sports, they can potentially trigger asthma symptoms in some people. Uh, however, it is really important that all people exercise to maintain overall good health. Um, exercise is great for the body, and just because someone has asthma doesn't necessarily mean that they can't engage in physical activity. Uh, in some cases, exercise can even help keep asthma well controlled. So if a person has asthma symptoms during exercise or physical activity, they may have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, and this is when the airways become tight and inflamed due to the physical activity. But there are ways, thankfully, to prevent these symptoms from happening while engaging in physical activity. Uh, one thing you can do or your child can do before physical activity is to warm up for about 10, 10 minutes or so and cool down for about 10 minutes after intense exercise. This, this can help prevent asthma symptoms. It can also be helpful to take breaks during physical activity. And sometimes providers, they'll also suggest taking asthma medicine. Uh, it kind of depends, but anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes prior to physical activity. 
And if this is the case for your child, then this must be documented on the child's asthma action plan, which must also be signed by your child's care provider or healthcare provider. And if you want more information on how to identify, diagnose, and manage exercise-induced asthma, you can visit afa.org slash exercise-induced-asthma. And now I will hand it back to Stacy. Yeah, thank you so much, Jessica. I know getting ready for school preparation is key. So let's sum it all up. We want to make sure, and I can't say this enough, that we communicate with school about your care plan. Every student with asthma and allergies should have a school health care plan which lists their symptoms, medications, and steps to take if they have symptoms. Every student with asthma and allergies should have a school um, care plan and make sure to contact your child's school to see what kind of plan your child's need and put it in place and get copies of this care plan and share them with your child's provider at your summer checkup. We also want to visit our doctor during the summer months. So schedule a well child asthma checkup during the summer. Bring those forms that are needed. Ask for all the refills you can. Ask for all the extra inhalers or spacers for school. And bring that communication plan with you. At this appointment, it's so important to get those refills for your child's medicines and bring all the forms that you want to bring to your doctor to fill up to, at this appointment. I cannot stress enough, write down all the questions you have to ask and then some, bring all the forms that you would like um, and really have a discussion with your provider and um, ask them to fill out and sign the forms. Don't forget to ask for an updated asthma action plan or even an anaphylaxis action plan for your child. They should absolutely be reviewed and updated at the start of every school year and remember, once you bring those forms and ask for them to be filled out, that your doctor may need a couple of weeks to fill out these forms. So make the appointment far enough in advance um, in the summer so that you can have these forms signed and in place before school starts. And also remember, because nebulizers may spread COVID-19, many schools are not using them. So ask your child's doctor for an extra inhaler or an extra spacer that you can keep this way. If your child forgets to bring an inhaler or it's empty, there will be one on hand. So you also want to meet with school staff and turn in those forms, make the appointments to talk to your school nurse or representative, your child's teacher before the first day of classes. If your child has asthma and will participate in sports, you want to talk to that sports director or coach. And this is just so your child's care plan will be in place beginning on the first day. And again, at this meeting, you want to turn in those signed forms and discuss the care plan. Some really great questions that I think that we are suggesting right here on this page, and it can be any questions that you want to ask, but some may be, where are my child's medicines going to be kept? Will they be easily accessible for my child? Are the staff trained on how to manage asthma and allergies? How do the school staff handle asthma episodes or attacks? or allergic reactions, and even so much as how is bullying handled in, in school regarding asthma and allergy episodes. Talk with your school to begin this process to create or update your child's care plan and meet with the staff who will be with your child during the school day. So teaching your child how to self-manage and advocate for themselves is really important. Um, it also can help them take charge of their own asthma. And this means they're going to be learning um, how to recognize when they have symptoms such as a cough or difficulty breathing, knowing when they need medicine like a quick relief or when to take their daily control medication. And most importantly, when to speak up when they need assistance or when they need to go to the school nurse. They can also teach their peer, their best friend, I think this is my most favorite part, on how to be a lookout and learn how to look out for asthma symptoms and encourage your child to self-manage and get help when they need. So that peer-to-peer -peer help, don't ever underestimate that. That is super important. So look out can always be a great addition. And prevention starts now. So in order to have a really successful year, we must prepare now. It's almost the end of summer, which makes me so sad, but I've got my 
doctor's appointments scheduled, my visits, and all of my forms checked. So let's make sure we all check in on our allergies, our triggers. Let's go to the doctor and get those vaccines that are needed to have a healthy and safe uh, school year. So right now, you might be wondering, what are my child's rights or are there any accommodations within schools for my child with asthma or allergies? And if you're new to school or transferring, you might be wondering what they are. So let's talk about that. Uh, for the next couple of slides. So a couple of accommodations. The American Disabilities Act is a federal civil rights law that gives people with disabilities the right to ask for changes where policies, practices, or conditions that leave you out or put you out at a disadvantage. The ADA borrows from Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 that says agencies, programs, services that receive federal money can absolutely not discriminate based on a disability when it comes to jobs or education. So this includes schools and childcare programs. These places must be accessible and usable by those with disabilities and asthma and allergies are usually considered disabilities under the ADA. So right there gives you your right and we know each school is different and it may require different forms. So again, going back to the beginning of the program, communicate with your child's school before the school year starts to see which forms they want and they require uh, in their office. We know that all schools with asthma need at minimum an emergency care plan. And this is typically an asthma action plan. Um, this is a medical plan from your child's doctor for the school to follow to treat asthma while the student is at school. The asthma action plan or emergency care plan can be wrapped into an individual health care plan, which goes into more detail and is more comprehensive than the emergency care plan. And all students with asthma would benefit from an IHP. Uh, not all students need a 504 plan, nor do they qualify for one, but it is another type of care plan that parents and guardians may request. So if we dig a little bit more deeper into what each of these plans are, the 504 plan is a contract between you and your child's school. It comes from Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and addresses how the school will accommodate your child's asthma. It's a legally binding contract written by the school in collaboration with a student and their family. And it provides guidelines for changes in the classroom or other school locations to achieve the goal of providing a safe education space. Um, an individual healthcare plan communicates with the school and will do what it can do to make sure your child has a safe school environment. This is a type of nursing care plan. And for a student with asthma, this would include an emergency care plan. And IHCP addresses what the school will do to establish and maintain a safe school environment for this child with asthma. So again, I encourage you to check with your state to see if they have laws that protect your child and their right to an education. So for example, your child has the right to carry their own medicine. And we know all 50 states have laws allowing children the right to self-carry their own medication. And each state has laws that protect this right. But you will need the form to file and put on file at the school signed by your child's doctor that says that they can carry these medications. So it's a little brief uh, snippet of accommodations. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. To review some forms and resources. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. So yeah, finally, we're just going to look at some tangible resources you can print out at home to enhance communication with your child's school. Stacy touched on a couple of them, but we'll go into them in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first is an asthma action plan. 
And this is a plan that's created by both the healthcare provider and the patient. It should be a written plan that includes the patient's identification, information, and also specific instructions on what asthma medications to take and when, and also when it's a good idea to call your child's provider or when it's a good idea to call 911. It's important to have the asthma action plan readily available at home, with caregivers, at school, and with others as appropriate. You're welcome to print off AFA's asthma action plan at afa.org slash action plan. But uh, just so you're aware, some schools do require that their approved form be used instead. And then I'll hand it back over to Stacy to talk a little bit about asthma emergency treatment plans. Yeah, I know we're talking about a lot of plans and a lot of forms today, but it's great that these are on um, our slides so that you can reference them and print them out and research them even more to see which one is the right one for you. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this asthma emergency treatment plan, which is a step-by-step -step instruction for anyone who um, on what to do in an emergency. So this is a really great resource to have on hand as a supplemental resource for the school or anyone who cares for your child. Again, it gives step-by-step -step instructions for anyone on what to do, what symptoms do they see, how is your child responding, what medications to take, um, and then when to call 911 when appropriate. So I would give this to everyone who cares for your child, um, and it should be with the asthma action plan as well. I'm gonna hand it over to Jessica and talk a little bit about an anaphylaxis emergency action plan. All right, thank you. So yeah, another good emergency plan to have on hand if your child has severe allergies uh, is an anaphylaxis emergency action plan. And this plan states what to do if your child is having a severe allergic reaction. Uh, it's important to, to give this form to your child's school and caregivers. And again, just so you're aware, it does require a healthcare provider's signature. I'll hand it back to Stacy. Yeah, so this is um, the form I was referencing earlier, the school supplementary treatment order. Remember, this does not replace the asthma action plan. It can be used in addition to the asthma action plan. It includes things like pre-activity treatments. It can list more in detail um, your allergies and triggers, and it encourages uh, communication between the school nurse and the healthcare provider and it also does require a provider signature. So uh, this would be a form, if you like this, this would be a form to take to your provider and have them fill it out and then bring it to the school if they would like to have it on file and keep it there um, to ensure that communication between nurse and provider. And I hand it back over to you, Jessica. Okay, so it can also be really helpful to make an appointment with your child's provider to go over an asthma visit checklist. Uh, this is something that can really encourage a conversation between your child's provider and caregivers, and also it can enhance communication uh, between your child's provider and the school as well. I'll hand it back to Stacy. Yeah, and the last one, um, this is a form which is a sample letter um, for a second inhaler. Spacer. So um, it can be helpful for your child, like we said, to have an extra spacer at home or to keep one at school. And this is a sample letter that school nurses can actually send to a child's parent requesting a second inhaler. It provides guidance around obtaining it for your child's provider. So perhaps you are a school nurse or you have a school nurse and you would like to have this form um, so that you can, can get a second inhaler or spacer and you can use that to bring to your provider and ask for that as well. So it's, I think it's really great form to have in addition. And we have one last pop quiz. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> I hope you all have enjoyed our pop quizzes. Um, I hope it doesn't bring back negative memories, but um, so Lima, let's launch this quiz and find out that today's conversation has helped me feel more confident going into the school year, gave me a step-by-step -step guide for what to do when my child with asthma goes back to school, helped me to understand how to talk to the school, or made me feel like I'm part of the community and not alone, or is it E, all of the above? So I'll give you maybe just a few more seconds to kind of think about those responses and what the answer might be. I'm gonna think about my answer. 
I think I have it. So let's go ahead and close that poll and share our results. Absolutely. It's always all of the above, right? The answer is E. We hope today's conversation has really left us with confidence going into the school year, giving you a step-by-step -step guide for how to tackle the new school year and understanding, and really most importantly, made you feel part of this inc um, inclusive community that we have here at Alpha. Um, so let's move on to our resources and thank you to the audience so much for participating in today's webinar. We really appreciate all of the questions that I see coming in and are being answered. So really, this input is really wonderful. So here are just a couple of resources. You can visit our AFA store for more educational material and handouts. At the AFA store, you will find an asthma action plan um, that you can print out. You can download it and print out. I would suggest having a stack of those in your office or at home so you can give and share those. We also have a support center, 1-800-7-ASMA, that's available 24-7 and during the weeks. And um, if you ever have a question or need um, answers, you can call that number. And we invite you to be part of our online communities at askafa.org backslash join, and even the food allergy community with kids with food allergies.org. These are really great online communities where you can talk and find um, colleagues across the country, even across the world, who have children or even have um, own asthma and food allergies themselves and really learn from each other and share your experiences and your stories. So it's a really great community and something that we really love. We also have a learning catalog and a database for Ask the Allergist. So you can go over to the webpage and just look through the information there for Ask the Allergist and a certified program. So earlier in the program, Jessica was talking about different air filters and products that you can get that are certified asthma and allergy friendly. Head on over to that site so that you can learn more about that and how to improve the indoor air quality in your home and your school as well. So now for the very final part, I think we have time for just a few more questions. I'm going to toss this over to Zalima um, to start us off with the Q&A portion of our presentation. Thank you. And Stacy, Jessica, great presentation. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful information you shared today. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and start our question and answer session. Uh, so our first question is, why does my child always get sick or their asthma gets worse when they go back to school? Oh man, I'll take that one. Um, it's a really great question. And this could be for several reasons. First, it's really common for kids to experience frequent illnesses and to be exposed to illnesses from other children, especially at school. So illness is a very common trigger for asthma. And there may also be an environmental trigger in school that your child is sensitive to. And if your child's asthma is fine at home but worsens at school, it is possible that this trigger is present at school but not in your home. Think things like class pets or carpets or things like that. Um, this could be anything from mold to dust, pollen, cleaning products, et cetera. Another possible explanation is that your child's asthma may be seasonal. Fall is allergy season, right? And it is also coincides with the start of school. So your child may be sensitive to pollens released in the fall back to school time as well. I'll hand it back over to you, Selena. Thank you. Okay, our next question, how can we improve our indoor air quality at school, especially when there are high pollen counts? Sure, sure, I'll take this one too. And as we noted during the presentation, there are some simple low cost steps you can take um, to improve your indoor air quality at school. First, let's encourage teachers to use only approved cleaners from custodial staff. Avoid strong smelling cleaners and chemicals air fresheners, scented candles, and disinfectants. I know they are attractive and they look pretty and smell pretty, but let's stay away from them and try to clean with unscented and less harsh chemicals. Let's reduce pet dander and avoid moles um, and avoid keeping that pet dander and 
those furry feathered pets in the classrooms, fix those leaks to quickly reduce the chance of molds, and you want to place those certified asthma and allergy friendly air cleaners in the classrooms and keep those windows shut on very high pollen counts and windy days. Our next question is, can my child carry their own inhaler or do they have to keep it in the office? And I can take that one. So that's a good question and we touched on it very briefly in the presentation, but we'll go into a little more detail here. Uh, so all 50 states, they do have laws that allow children to self-carry and administer their asthma medication as needed. However, these laws do vary by state, so it's best to become familiar with your state's law around self-carrying and then uh, have a conversation with your child's provider to determine if they are actually ready to self-carry and then communicate with school staff, teachers, and a school nurse around self-carrying. Uh, it's also important, important to know or to recognize that self-carry is different than self-administer. So some kids may be ready to carry, but they might need an adult's help to actually take their medicine. Uh, also, sometimes school policies can differ from state laws. Uh, so your child's school might require an asthma action plan or a letter uh, indicating that your child has permission to self-carry. And typically the action plan or the letter must be signed by your child's healthcare provider. And I'll hand it back to you, Zalima. Thank you. Our next question, what is the difference between a cough and an asthma cough? Uh, I can take that one too. So a cough, uh, it can be a symptom of, of a lot of different medical conditions like acid reflux, allergies, respiratory illness, asthma. Um, an asthma cough, it, it typically lasts a long time, usually at least six to eight weeks. It's typically dry. It doesn't usually produce mucus, although there's sometimes there can be exceptions to that. And it is also common for the cough to worsen with exercise. However, it, it's really important to note that only a licensed healthcare provider can officially diagnose or, or determine if the cough is due to asthma. And oftentimes a person who has a chronic cough will be referred to a specialist. And in some cases, the, the cause of the cough actually can't be identified, so it's unknown. And I'll hand it back to you, Zalima. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question. My child's school does not have a school nurse. Who should I talk to about their asthma? I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, you and your child's school both want your child to have a quality, safe education in a very safe environment. So remember, forming a partnership in the beginning with your child's school is key when it comes to successfully managing your asthma and allergies. So with that said, start by communicating with the school about your child's asthma and writing ask for meetings with key people and personnel within the planning process, think school administrator, school nurse, or school principal. And this often includes those uh, personnel that I just stated. And if there's not one there, perhaps someone in your school administration, the primary care teach the primary teacher in their care, or sometimes even the school principal will be uh, the person that you can talk to about your child's asthma. Okay, with that, we are going to wrap up today's webinar session. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Jessica, both again for your wonderful presentation. We hope that this information was very helpful to you. And on behalf of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, we'd like to thank everyone for participating today and joining us. Um, we hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks.